Though Ellie Fenhill perished during her adventures with you, she went out the way she would have wanted, in a blaze of violence and infamy. Though Ellie's tenure on the Unreliable ended sooner than she would have liked, she enjoyed her time there nonetheless. She returned to the Groundbreaker's orbit, where she continued running missions of dubious legality, shunning respectable work, and living life to the fullest. At the Lost Hope Bar, she got plenty of mileage and free drinks out of tales of her adventures with the legendary crew of the Unreliable. Some of them were even true. After you killed her parents, Ellie left the Unreliable. She returned to her old life in the Groundbreaker's orbit, but her days of mischief and nights of carousal had lost their appeal. She found herself taking bigger and more foolish risks, but something irrevocable had changed. Ellie savored her adventures on the Unreliable. Once they were done, she returned to life as usual, running missions of dubious legality, shunning respectable work, and living life to the fullest. She meant to reach out to her one-time captain, but she was always bad at keeping in touch. Your influence further cemented Ellie's perspective. She understood she could never truly rely on others, so she set about making sure she wouldn't have to. With a steady income from the life insurance payouts, she was finally able to afford a ship of her own. She enjoyed a long and infamous career running missions across the system. Some of them were even legal. Your influence shifted Ellie's perspective. She finally admitted, albeit grudgingly, that she just might need other people. Sometimes. With a steady income from the life insurance payouts, she was finally able to afford a ship of her own. She hired a small crew and flew supply missions to communities on the fringe. Some of them were even legal. Felix Millstone never lived to see what became of the colony. He did not survive his encounter with you. There are no official records of Felix Millstone leaving the labyrinth. Some say he found himself a reasonably cozy cell and carved his name into the wall. The story of Felix Millstone ended when he parted ways with his crew. No one knows if he survived in the years to come. Every now and then, a new story involving head injuries and tossball sticks made the rounds. Clyde Harlow and his gang of pirates never had the chance to go down in a blaze of defiance. The deteriorating state of the colony took its toll, and they fell into mutiny when their supplies ran low. Felix was not one of the crew killed in that mutiny. He disappeared, only to reappear a year later in board custody. Out of respect for his previous services, Sophia Akande spared his life and added him to the lifetime employment program instead. He remains in suspended animation to this day. He disappeared, only to reappear a few months later in Terra II, looking to help the effort to save Halcyon. He was given a job hauling boxes for a local laboratory. Life in Halcyon was sobering for Felix Millstone. The grand revolution he dreamed of never came. There was no great awakening for the colony, no celebrations in the streets. There was only the hard, desperate work of trying to repair a broken colony. Felix never had a head for numbers, but if there was labor to be done, he was there to help. Eventually, Felix realized that the work of a revolution was done with two hands. As the board reasserted control over Halcyon, Felix came to realize that his life as an upstart rebel had come to an end. The board's victory crushed any hope for a grand revolution across Halcyon, and so Felix once again found himself without a purpose in life. And so, disillusioned with his former boss and with nowhere left to go, Felix left his crew without saying goodbye. He was never heard from again. And so, with nowhere else left to turn, Felix continued to work for his boss, the only person with whom he'd ever belonged. 
He turned bitter and jaded over the years, but he always did as he was told. The vicar, Maximilian de Soto, died while serving aboard the Unreliable. It may not have been what he wanted, but he surely would have preferred it to living out his days in Edgewater. Unshackled from a lifetime of striving and fighting the universe and himself, Vicar Maximilian de Soto was at peace when he sacrificed his life as part of the crew of the Unreliable. After being unceremoniously ejected from the crew of the Unreliable, Max, disillusioned, tried to rejoin the OSI, but was defrocked for leaving his post in Edgewater. When the vicar known as Max was unceremoniously ejected from the crew of the Unreliable, he took this as a sign that it was time to move on, to live out the life he had sought so long to create. He lived out his days as a common laborer in a dying company town. He made his living for a time as a common laborer in a dying company town before being rejected for the lifetime employment program. His ultimate fate is unknown. As much as he enjoyed his adventures aboard the Unreliable, the vicar known as Max eventually decided that it was time to move on, to live out the life he had sought so long to create. After all he'd seen and heard adventuring with you, the vicar Maximilian de Soto renounced his faith and joined the effort to rebuild the colony. Ironically, he finally found the joy that had eluded him over the course of his life and realized that perhaps he was always meant to be just a simple laborer after all. He quickly dismissed the idea. He knew there were many in the colony who carried burdens much worse than the ones he had struggled with, and he devoted himself to easing their suffering wherever he could. He only ever took up arms again to defend the defenseless. Unshackled from a lifetime of striving and fighting the universe and himself, Vicar Maximilian de Soto was finally at peace. As a reward for his part in her courageous rescue, the adjutant invited the vicar known as Max to become one of the leaders of the Order of Scientific Inquiry. But Max had no interest in serving any organization, let alone the OSI, which he knew would never tolerate his heretical theories. Instead, he attempted to minister to the people of Byzantium. They rejected his ideas, being far too satisfied with their own material comforts. Disillusioned, Max gave up and left the city. He was never heard from again. Max eventually rose to the top, becoming the presiding bishop of the OSI. He denounced his spiritual meanderings as a misguided attempt to come to terms with his long-dead parents. His only regret was that they had not lived long enough to see that he was right all along. Parvati didn't survive her adventure with you. After Parvati left the crew of the Unreliable, little was heard from her again. She exchanged occasional messages with Ada, but they were light on details and grew increasingly infrequent. Months later, her name appeared on the manifest of a research vessel that vanished during an unexpected solar storm. Once the matter with the Hope colonists was resolved, June Lay bashfully asked Parvati if she'd like to join her permanently on the Groundbreaker, and Parvati enthusiastically, if somewhat awkwardly, agreed. As the board began to roll out their lifetime employment program, Parvati was increasingly plagued by dreams of freezing to death and rarely left their shared quarters. Stymied by dwindling resources, Jun Lei struggled to keep the groundbreaker afloat. Their relationship couldn't survive the strain. Parvati moved into crew quarters and found work servicing water pumps in hydroponics. The stories of her adventures spread across the colony, and Parvati soon found herself the center of attention. Having served as the engineer of a renowned spacecraft, tramp freighters and wildcat miners sought her out by name and in no time, she was a fixture in the Groundbreaker's mechanical ecosystem. She and Jun Lei were never far apart. After Jun Lei's murder, Parvati turned inward. She was merely quiet at first, and she wouldn't speak unless spoken to. 
Eventually, she stopped speaking at all. Once the matter of the Hope colonists was resolved, she slipped unobtrusively from the unreliable during a refueling stopover. She took nothing from her berth and left no word of where she'd gone. After June Lay's murder, Parvati disappeared from the unreliable during a refueling stopover. She left no word of where she went, only a snippet of a poem she'd meant to send June Lay, written by a long-dead earth writer, John Donne. It read, Study me then, you who shall lovers be, at the next world, that is, at the next spring, for I am every dead thing in whom love wrought new alchemy. Though Parvati eventually grew comfortable aboard the Unreliable, she never quite came out of her shell. She seemed to prefer the company of Ada to the crew, and she could often be found neck deep in cables and grease, telling Ada funny stories from her childhood. As the board began to roll out their lifetime employment program, Parvati was plagued by dreams of freezing to death. She began taking increasingly longer shore leaves, and she eventually disappeared from the unreliable entirely. The board never knew what became of her, and under the adjutant's orders, they never tried to find out. Parvati was afforded a measure of peace and left to her own devices. Though Parvati eventually grew comfortable aboard the unreliable, she never quite came out of her shell, and she often wished aloud that her dad was still alive to teach her about the finer points of starship care and maintenance. While the colony fell into chaos, she found an island of relative peace with Ada, and they formed an unusual bond. She decided to remain aboard the Unreliable permanently as its chief and sole engineer. Nioka didn't survive her adventure with you. Nioka returned to Monarch to take another crack at making a permanent life for herself. She formed the Charon Group, an MSI subsidiary of ragtag survivalists and wilderness experts. Anyone in need of a guide, or just looking to throw back a beer and swap stories, could find her camping on the trail or clearing an infestation. Nioka returned to Monarch to take another crack at making a permanent life for herself. She formed the Charon Group, a mercenary outfit of ragtag survivalists and wilderness experts. Anyone in need of a guide, or just looking to throw back a beer and swap stories, could find her camping on the trail or clearing an infestation. As hard as she tried to drink them away, Nioka's memories eventually overcame her. Traveling with the crew served as a constant reminder of the family she'd lost, and so she eventually returned to Monarch to get back to what she found most comfortable, the deep end of a bottle and the far end of a trail. Few have seen her since, but travelers often swear they hear her and her machine gun in the night, screaming swears and spitting bullets. Before his untimely death, Captain Alex Hawthorne had plans to restore and modify, for combat purposes, a sanitation and maintenance auto-mechanical that he'd found in a state of disrepair in Emerald Vale's scrapyard. That unit remains broken down and forgotten in the unreliable supply closet to this day. The SAM unit that accompanied you spread awareness of the product line's superior sanitation and maintenance capabilities across what was left of the colony. This led to a boost in SAM unit sales. Did you know that SAM units are the longest-lasting, toughest-acting cleaning solution in Halcyon?